Hi, fifth grade. So today we are going to be reading chapter four and five. I encourage you to follow along because I'm going to be stopping on certain pages and asking questions. I will put all of the questions in the description of the video below. So if you need to look at them again, you can either rewind and hear me say them again, or you can read them down below the video. I am going through in that order and then making sure I pause to ask the questions as topics come up. I know that looking right now at the rest of the year, we're probably not going to, we're going to be finishing up the book the last week of school. So we will be doing like a sort of mini project thing as we end the book. But as far as after the book, probably not, unfortunately. We would have gone through a lot faster if we were at school. But I hope you guys are enjoying it. I hope you enjoy today's chapters. <clears throat> Chapter four. Mrs. Olinsky sat waiting until all the members of her class were seated. Then she introduced herself. I am Mrs. Olinsky. I am one of those people who gets to use all the good parking spaces at the mall. She turned toward the blackboard and wrote in big block letters, Mrs. Olinsky, paraplegic. As she wrote paraplegic, Mrs. Olinsky spelled it out. P-A-R-A-P-L-E-G-I-C. It means that I am paralyzed from the waist down. Mrs. Olinsky had thought about what she would say to this, her first sixth grade class in 10 years. She wrote it all down, revised, memorized, and rehearsed until she could deliver her lines with a light touch. Her voice held steady, but her hands did not, and the O of Olinsky was the rough shape of an oil spill. Then a student in the back, Hamilton Knapp, stood up. Excuse me, Mrs. Olinsky, he said, hesitating slightly, mispronouncing, oh, oh <laughs> I forgot to mispronounce her name. Miss Olinsky, he said, hesitating slightly, mispronouncing her name. I can't see what you've written. Could you write a little higher on the blackboard, please? Mrs. Olinsky replied, not at the moment, and managed an embarrassed smile. The rest of her prepared remarks flew out of her head. She thought she had thought of everything, but here she was with a problem about sight lines to the blackboard. Given time, she would figure it out, but she wished it had not come up on the very first hour of her first day back. After Hamilton Knapp sat down, she laughed nervously. I was about to tell you that being a paraplegic does not mean that there is anything wrong with my hearing or my eyesight, but I guess we'll have to figure out what to do about the eyesight of those of you who will be seated in the back of the room. Mrs. Olinsky decided that she would write nothing more on the blackboard for the rest of the morning, but would leave what she had already written right there so that she could check it out after lunch. She would return from before the rest of the class, wheel herself to the back of the room while it was still empty, and check out the sight lines. She took the role, checking on the spelling and pronunciation of each child's name, and passed out general supplies and the books for the social studies she would be teaching. Finally, she assigned seats in alphabetical order, last names first. The year of her accident, Mrs. Olinsky had had two Jennifers in her class. This semester, Jennifer was out of fashion and J names for boys were in. She had J names from Jared to Julian, including two Jasons, when she returned from lunch and saw Cripple written on the blackboard. She knew more than the names had changed. Sixth graders had changed. Ethan finished answering the four-part question about the history of the state of New York. The first women's rights convention organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Auburn was the home of Harriet Tubman, who ran the Underground Railroad. That registers six points for the Epiphany team, the commissioner said. There was a spontaneous burst of applause from their side of the aisle that was immediately suppressed by the commissioner. I must admonish the, the audience not to applaud. It is distracting to both teams. Mrs. Olinsky remembered the day that that rude applause had distracted a performance. Her fourth choice had been causing her problems, but it had been on the very day when rude applause interrupted a play that she had made the fourth and final choice for her team. It was the Saturday afternoon after they became the Souls, sometime after they had finished their four o'clock tea, when Julian had said, We must have a project, and Noah had asked, Isn't peeling wallpaper enough? Julian grinned and said no. He took a small object from his pants pocket and kept it hidden in his fist. He rested his hands lightly on the edge of the table. 
and the calligraphy lessons. Aren't they enough? Julian said no again, and Noah asked, Now what? Nadia said, I think Julian already has something in mind. Indeed, I do. Julian turned his fist over and opened his hand. There, within his palm, was a small ivory monkey, only two inches high. He laid it on the table and waited until each of the souls had inspected it thoroughly before saying, Gopal gave me this little sculpture. It can do tricks. Julian then stood the little figure first on one foot, then the other, one arm, then the other. You see, this monkey can balance on any one of its four limbs. Noah asked, what is that supposed to mean? Ethan replied, I think it has something to do with Mrs. Olinsky. Julian smiled broadly. Indeed, it does. Mrs. Olinsky? Noah repeated. Mrs. Olinsky? What? I think that Julian wants us to help her, Ethan explained. Help her do what? Noah asked. Nadia said, Stand on her own two feet. Have you ever heard that expression, Noah? Of course I have heard that expression, but fact, Mrs. Olinsky cannot stand on her own two feet, and further fact, she obviously... Noah's voice trailed off as he understood. I get it, he said. I get it. It is scary trying to stand on your own two feet, especially when you don't have a leg to stand on, so to speak. Julian rubbed the little ivory monkey. There are some in the school who try to get her off balance. Some are in our home room. We can give her some support, Ethan said. Better than that, Nadia said. We can give her a lift. They all turned to Noah. What do you suggest? They asked, knowing Noah would have an answer. And he did. All right, this is first stop. So, page 97, stop. Question is, what object does Julian have to represent Mrs. Olinsky? What object does Julian have to represent Mrs. Olinsky? Again, if I go, if I, you are going to stop and answer the question, just pause the video each time because I'm going to keep reading so we don't make a crazy long video. The commissioner reached into the bowl again. He allowed his hand to touch bottom before spreading his fingers to pick up the next question. An acronym is defined as a word formed from the initial letters of a series of words. For example, radar is an acronym for radio detecting and ranging. R-A from radio, D from detecting, A from and, and R from ranging. Can you give me two more examples of acronyms that have entered our language as words? Julian, S Julian Singh's buzzer went off. Posh and tip, he called out. <clears throat> Julian narrates when Ginger played Annie's Sandy. Uh, quick thing here, I am... Not sure I can do a British accent the whole time, so I'm just going to do it when he speaks out loud. It was the Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend that Ethan Potter suggested to Nadia Diamondstein that she have Ginger play Annie's Sandy. I had no idea what he was talking about. I knew, of course, that Ginger referred to Nadia's beloved and talented dog, so I thought that perhaps Annie's Sandy was a video game played by the canine orders. However, the word play referred to playing a part in a musical show about an orphan named Annie in a show called Annie, and Sandy was the name of the dog belonging to the title character. Epiphany High School was putting on the play for the holiday season. Until we moved to Epiphany, I had no idea how busy Americans are between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day, the time they refer to as the holiday season. Everyone asks, are you ready for the holidays? And then afterward they ask, how were your holidays? During the holidays themselves, no one asks about them. When Ethan suggested that Nadia have Ginger try out, Nadia said, Ginger does not do ARF. Another remark I did not understand. I did not intend to ask. I knew that if I waited, an explanation would come. It did. The play, Annie, is based on an American comic strip called Little Orphan Annie, and when Annie's Sandy speaks, in the balloon over his head is written ARF. Everyone had already been cast for the high school production, but not the dog Sandy, and Mrs. Reynolds, the play's director, had put a notice on the bulletin board that anyone with a well-trained dog could try out. Ethan said, They call it a cattle call. Noah said, Why would they call it a cattle call if they are asking for dogs? Ethan said, 
It's a theatrical saying. It means an open audition. Even if they mean people, they call it a cattle call. Then what do you they what do they call a cattle call? Noah asked. Ethan replied, A roundup, I guess. He turned to Nadia and said, Ginger's bark will do very well. Besides, she looks a lot like Sandy, except that her eyeballs aren't blank. In time I came to understand that remark too. The artist who drew the comic strip never drew irises on the eyes of people or dogs. Noah said, There's one other thing. Nadia ignored Noah. She said to Ethan, If I do have Ginger try out, she will get the part. Ginger is a genius. Noah said, There's one other thing. Nadia turned to Noah and said, Ginger is a genius. She will get the part. Nadia, my dear, Noah insisted, Sandy is a male. In fact, Ginger is a, if you'll excuse the expression, a... I'm... I'm not getting demonetized. <laughs> just kidding. I can't get demonetized. I don't have a branded channel. I don't need to read it out loud. From everything I have ever learned in health education, genes, not genius, determine, if you'll excuse the expression, sex. Fact, unless Ginger visits a plastic surgeon, she won't fit the part. Nadia said, Noah, is there any subject in this whole world that you do not know more than about more about than every other being on this planet? All right, so on page 100, the bad word is actually one that has two meanings. The one used in the story is obviously the meaning of a female dog. Don't freak out. Instead, answer this. Who convinces Nadia to let Ginger try out for the play? So actually, I'm going to read a little bit more. I want you to listen, figure out who convinces Nadia to let Ginger try out for the play. Noah shrugged. Not every other being on the planet. Let's just say every other being in this room. Do you have a dog? She asked. No, but just answer the question. Do you have a dog? No, but just answer the question. Have you ever had a dog? No, but just answer the question. Have you ever had a dog? No. Nadia said, I rest my case. Noah would not give up. Have you ever had allergies that kept you from having a dog? He asked. No. Have you ever had a brother who had allergies that kept you from having a dog? No, I have not, and neither have you. Have you ever had a brother? No. I- Ethan interrupted. Getting back to Ginger, you ought to let her try out. Nadia said, I shall. She will get the part, and they will consider themselves lucky, which they should, because Ginger is a genius. The bickering between Nadia and Noah no longer made me uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I had begun to enjoy it. And so had we all, including Noah and Nadia. Once Nadia made her decision to have Ginger try out for the part, I told them that in the days when I had traveled with my parents on the cruise line, I saw a number of animal acts. There were not many, for keeping animals on board ship is not easy. I explained that wild animals were out of the question, as were the larger varieties of domestic animals, such as cow or horse. There was a monkey once, but it was a terrible thief. The monkey, whose name was Sapphire, his hindquarters were bright blue, would swing down from a flagpole or a railing and steal shiny objects like pens or barrettes or even worse, jewelry. Sapphire always would drink anything that was left unattended in a cup or a glass. As a result, Sapphire was often drunk and incapable of bladder control. Most passengers were not amused, and the captain had Sapphire and his owner put off the ship at the next port. Most of the animal acts on board involve dogs, I explained. From watching them, I learned what trainers do. So it was that even before the cattle call, the souls began the intensive training of Ginger. I taught each of the souls how to palm a treat so that no one in the audience would notice. First, we taught Ginger to respond to Nadia, and then Nadia fused with Ethan, and then Ethan with Noah, then Noah with me, until at last Ginger would respond to the treat, and not the person. We trained Ginger to accept the treat without excessive salivating. Most people who are not dog owners, and even many who are, do not care very much for a tongue bath. Ethan got a copy of the script. In the play, the policeman asks, Is that your dog, little girl? And Sandy is supposed to bark. We taught Ginger how to bark on cue, 
Ginger to bark on cue, and the more she did it, the more it sounded like arf. Ginger had learned her lines. Ginger had learned her cues. Ginger was a genius. Eight dogs, their owners, the tire, entire class, cast of the play, and the souls attended the dog tryouts. I had thought about bringing Alice, but Papa advised against it. He said that a daughter should not be in competition with her mother, but I think he would have missed her during the time she would be at rehearsals. Alice and Papa kept each other company when I was at school. Alice had become our early warning system. Every time someone started up the path to Sillington House, Alice barked to let us know. We were a little concerned that when we had paying guests, which would be soon, this might be a problem. One of the eight dogs was quickly eliminated on grounds of disobedience. The second had a problem with his plumbing, and Mrs. Reynolds was not amused by the snickers in the audience or the mess on stage. The next two were small, nervous creatures that looked like battery-operated plush toys. They did not run in a straight line, but zigzagged and yipped their way across the stage. Numbers five and six were male and did embarrassing things to legs, any legs, male or female, that happened to be on stage. The two remaining contenders were Ginger and Michael Frolic's dog, Arnold. Arnold, a well-behaved yellow Labrador retriever, was larger than Ginger and was, quite decidedly and obviously, male. I wanted Ginger to get the part, not only because she belonged to Nadia, and not only because she was Alice's mother, but also because I did not want Michael Frolic to have the honor. Since those first weeks at school, I had done my best to avoid both Michael Frolic and his friend Hamilton Knapp. Arnold tried out before Ginger. The girl who was to play Annie stood center stage, clapped her hands upon her thighs, and Arnold leaped across the stage, placed his paws upon Annie's shoulders, and caused her to lean backward. She almost fell. Frolic ran across the stage and quickly hooked a leash to Arnold's collar and said to stage Annie, I promise you that won't happen again, but it will help if you dig your heels in a little. Mrs. Reynolds, the drama teacher, said, Next! It was Ginger's turn, and stage Annie once again clapped her hands on her knees. Nadia quietly whispered, Go, Ginger! Gave her a little push on her rump and quickly crossed to the other side of the stage behind the backdrop and stood in the wings on the opposite side of the stage, where no one in the audience could see her, but Ginger could. In between stood stage Annie, holding a treat. Privately, before tryouts, I had slipped backstage and taught stage Annie how to pump a treat and pass it off so that no one in the audience could see. Ginger walked across the stage with enthusiasm and dignity and quietly nuzzled stage Annie's hand before sitting at her feet. Ginger was in every way clearly superior to every other dog there. Even her mixed breed looks better suited the part than Arnold's purebred sleekness. Ginger was first rate. Ginger had star quality. Ginger got the part. Mrs. Reynolds, the drama coach, who was director of the play, said, Ginger will be Annie Sandy, and Arnold will be Ginger's understudy. We souls, sitting in the audience, applauded, and Ethan stood and yelled, Bravo, Mrs. Reynolds, bravo! Ethan had always wanted to stand up in a theater and yell, bravo. Mrs. Reynolds said, Who is that? Who is doing that yelling? Ethan waved his hand and called out, It's me, Mrs. Reynolds. Me, here. Uh, Ethan Potter. Mrs. Reynolds shielded her eyes from the footlights to see out over the audience. Ethan Potter? Still screening her eyes, she smiled. Ethan Potter, I didn't recognize you. I believe that she did not recognize him, for the person yelling bravo was Ethan the soul, not Ethan the silent. Then she asked, How is your grandmother, Ethan? She's fine, Mrs. Reynolds. She got married last summer. I heard, Mrs. Reynolds replied. And how is that big brother of yours? How's Lucas? He's fine, Mrs. Reynolds. Will you tell him I said hello? Yes, I will. When will you see him again? He'll be home for Christmas. I hope he'll come see the play, she said. Will you tell him? Yeah, yes, I will. Ethan did not say another word until we left the auditorium that day. All right, next question. Ethan gets very quiet before they leave the auditorium after auditions. Why? Oh, wait, I didn't repeat it. Ethan gets very quiet after they leave the auditorium, or before they leave the auditorium after auditions. Why? Ginger leaned... Ginger, <laughs> Ginger learned to bark arf on cue and quickly won the hearts of the entire cast as well as Mrs. Reynolds. Nadia was beaming. 
Nadia had kindly passed along training information to Frolic and to Stage Annie, and Arnold's performance improved to within a shade of Ginger's. It would have been better if Arnold had been eliminated altogether. Second best can be worse than not in the running. Who knew what was happening inside Frolic's head as he trained Arnold? Who knew what was happening inside Frolic's head when he attended rehearsals? He had to attend them all, and had nothing to do except to wait backstage and watch admiration and affection be heaped on Ginger. That amounted to a lot of work for little glory. During the actual performances, he and Arnold were to stay backstage and out of sight, unless something happened to Ginger. Did having Arnold as understudy make Frolic feel like an underdog? I was not without worry. The main performance was to be on Saturday evening before the winter recess. That was when friends and family would attend. This event was exciting for Papa and me, not only because Alice's mother was about to make her dramatic debut, but also because Sillington House was, too. Mr. and Mrs. Diamondstein were flying up from Florida to celebrate Christmas with, Christmas with the Potters, and would be our first paying guests. They planned to arrive in time to see Ginger play Annie's Sandy. Papa had only one of the guest bedrooms ready, but he was quite proud of it, and so was I. He hung the bed linen out on the clothesline he strung across the backyard so that everything would smell of the sweet air that blew off the lake. He purchased a beautiful cut glass carafe and matching drinking glass and put them on the nightstand by the bed. He purchased a poinsettia and put it on the, on the dresser. In the closet were the heavy hangers of polished wood, not those permanently attached things that you find in cheap motels, nor the weak wire ones that you get from the dry cleaners, that Papa had bought in England. We had them all facing the same way, so that their shadows on the wall looked like a computer rendering of an architectural cross-section. The sink and tub were scrubbed until their whiteness could snow blind. The faucets shone bright enough to use as mirrors. The Diamondsteins arrived on the Friday afternoon before the official start of the school holiday. That was the afternoon that I and all the other members of the elementary and middle schools of Epiphany were to attend a special matinee performance of Annie. For the cast, it would be something more than a full dress rehearsal because of a full live audience. Everyone at Epiphany Middle School... Oh, wait. Did I skip a question? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm sorry. Everyone at Epiphany Middle School was to be transported to the high school by bus. That meant walkers and carpoolers were all going by bus so that our usual seating arrangement was not in order. I had a window seat. Jared Lord had the window seat two rows in front of me. Ham Knapp took the seat next to him. Ever since the first few weeks of school, when I could not avoid Knapp and his friends, I did my best to ignore them, but I was never unaware of them. Since I had become a soul, and since Frolic had started attending rehearsals, I had become less concerned about him. But Ham was another matter. I was never, never unaware of him or any of his friends. Whenever Knapp was anywhere nearby, all my senses were on alert. Even though it was late December, the sun, pouring in through the windows of the bus as it waited in the car park, had heated up like a greenhouse. We were dressed in woolens, so we opened the windows before sitting down for the ride to the high school. I mentioned all of this because I mentioned all of this because as soon as the bus started out of the car park, the wind coming through the open windows of the bus caused a peculiar warp in the sound. The first word I heard was tranquilizer. It flowed out of one window and back in through mine as clearly as if Ham Knapp were sitting in the seat next to me. I rested my head against the window post and began to listen intently. The woof of wind produced by cars approaching the opposite direction caused some blanks in the conversation. But I heard enough. Tranquilizer and laxative. How did you... Scent biscuits, doggy treats, for this star dog. Laxatives and tranquilizers, and those four little legs will buckle and those little bowels won't hold. There followed some laughter and some mumbling. Nadia had told the souls about Ginger's bad reaction to tranquilizers during her trip to Florida last August. She could very well have told this to everyone, including Frolic. Frolic could have told Nap, or Nap could have heard it himself, for Nadia enjoyed talking about Ginger. Tranquilizers and laxatives pass out like a mop, instant coma. What's the point? She'll pass out backstage. Point is that star dog Ginger is out and buddy dog Arnold is in. It was clear Ham meant harm to Ginger. No problem. Mother keeps a supply. Why would his mother keep a supply of animal tranquilizers at home? 
Sneezy. Gave them to Nadia. Gift for my mother. Of course. Knapp's mother was a veterinarian, the owner and operator of Vet in a Van. On several occasions, I had seen the van bring Ham to school. The van was painted with the Vet in a Van logo, and beneath it was written, Pat Knapp, DVM. I had assumed that Dr. Pat Knapp was a man, and that his mother had borrowed the car. It had not occurred to me that his mother was the vet in the van. It took no great leap of intelligence to realize that Hamilton Knapp had laced Ginger's dog treats with tranquilizers and laxatives, so that she would do one, possibly two, embarrassing, thing embarrassing things on stage. He gave Nadia the drug treats and told her that they were a gift from Dr. Knapp, who was Ginger's veterinarian. I could easily picture Hamilton Knapp telling Nadia that Dr. Knapp wanted Ginger to have these special treats for her performance. Nadia was so crazy about Ginger that she would believe that anyone who met her wanted to give her gifts. As soon as the bus stopped, I made my way forward and slipped a Year of the Soul's penny into Noah's hand. In the crush of the bus door, I had time to whisper, Backstage emergency. Cover for me. For reasons we had not spoken of yet, of, of yet each of us understood, none of us was ready to reveal our association. I watched Noah make his way toward Ethan and pass a soul penny to him. He had understood. I knew he would. Just inside the auditorium, Noah bent down to tie his shoe, and Ethan tripped over him. They caused enough confusion for me to slip back outside and run around toward the back of the building and enter the auditorium through the stage door. I was backstage. I stayed in the shadow of the wings for a minute until I could get my bearings. The cast was jabbering, tugging at their clothes, too excited about themselves to pay attention to anyone else. The first time Ginger appears on stage, she is running in front of the dog catcher. She is supposed to be a stray, and her fur must look matted and dirty. Nadia accomplishes this, accomplished this by wetting portions of Ginger's fur and tamping them down. From the audience, the wet spots look dark and dirty. For Ginger's second appearance, she wears a rope leash, and for her final appearance, a scene in which Ginger and Annie have taken up residence at the mansion of the wealthy Daddy Warbucks. Ginger as Sandy appears clean and brushed and wears a rhinestone collar and red ribbon around her neck. Between acts, Nadia has time to dry Ginger's fur and brush her until her coat glistens. Backstage between the wings stood the prop table where Nadia kept the big red bow and rhinestone collar, the hairdryer, the rope, and the treats that stage Annie uses to entice Ginger. I saw the table and worked my way invisibly through the backstage crowd, a technique I had learned from Gopal when I helped him with his act on board the cruise ship. The treats were already laid out on the props table. I saw the rope. I also saw a fancy collar, but it was wider than Ginger's, and the red bow was different. I examined the treats. They, too, were different. They were shaped like strips of bacon. Ginger's usual treats were shaped like, a, like small bones. I was sure that these were drugged. I edged my way over to the table to pick up the dog biscuits and throw them away. I would destroy these treats, and then, if time and opportunity allowed, I would find Nadia's supply and substitute good ones for the drugged ones. All right, next question. What secret plot does Julian discover? What secret plot does Julian discover? If time and opportunity did not allow, then Ginger would have to go into her act without a bribe. I would count on Ginger's genius. Before I had a chance to scoop up the bacon-shaped treats from the table, I saw Frolic and Arnold coming out of the boys' dressing room. Arnold was wet down and not wearing his collar or dog tags. Mrs. Reynolds was waiting outside the boys' dressing room. She smiled and said something to Frolic and then called, Places, everyone! As the backstage crowd started breaking up, I saw Nadia. She was holding Ginger's leash and carrying the shopping bag where she kept her props. Ginger was still wearing her regular collar and dog tags. Had something already happened to Ginger? It was only minutes to curtain. I changed directions and slipped back into the shadow of the wings. I waited until Nadia came within a few feet of where I stood. I came forward, slipped a Year of the Soul's penny into her hand, and immediately returned to the shadows. Nadia gave no indication that she had the penny, but she was at my side in less than a minute. Is Ginger all right? I asked. She's fine, she said, shortening her leash and laying the shopping bag down on the floor. She reached down to pet Ginger. Ginger is having a day off. It was Mrs. Reynolds' idea. Mike Frolic has been so good about coming to rehearsals, and Arnold has become so well-trained that Mrs. Reynolds decided to let him play Sandy at this performance. Oh, I said. When did you find out? Just this morning. Do not worry. Arnold is only a substitute. 
Ginger will appear at all of the evening performances. So, the treats on the props table are Arnold's, not Ginger's? In a manner of speaking. Our vet sent them over for Ginger, but since Arnold's performing today, I gave him some. We both use the same vet. The treats awaiting Arnold were drugged. Neither Michael nor Nadia knew it. And Hamilton Knapp did not know that Arnold, not Ginger, was about to consume them. I could save Arnold from the poison treats, let him go on and let Knapp think that his dirty trick had worked, one for the price of two. Or I could let Arnold eat the drug treats, embarrass Frolic, and let Ginger go on, two for the price of one. There they were, waiting on the prop table. There they were, waiting for my decision. Why are you here, Julian? Nadia asked. To wish you break a leg, I said. Break a leg is what you say to theater people instead of good luck. And what do you say to theater dogs? She asked. You double it. You say, break two legs. Nadia laughed. Really? She asked. Really? I replied. Nadia laid her shopping bag down at my feet and tugged at Ginger's leash. Come along, Ginger, she said. Let's go wish some people to break some legs. I watched them walk away. I made my decision. I waited in the dark of the wing until the orchestra was well into playing the overture, for then I knew that the house lights would be lowered and I could make my way to my seat unnoticed. Noah and Ethan had propped their jackets and backpacks on an aisle seat so that the shadow cast in the darkened auditorium could easily be mistaken for a person. I slipped into the seat, nodded to both Noah and Ethan, and waited for Sandy's first appearance on stage. The first time Sandy appeared, running across the stage being chased by the dog catcher, the audience broke into spontaneous applause. The second time, the policeman asked, Is that your dog, little girl? And Sandy walked across the stage and sat at stage Annie's feet, and once again the audience broke into applause. This time, however, when the applause was about to die down, Knapp and Lord exchanged a triumphant look and began barking, Arf! 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 and clapping in rhythm. Soon all the other kids picked up on that, and the play could not continue. Senior monitors started fanning down the aisles to locate the source of the trouble, but before the monitor was even with their row, Knapp's hands were folded in his lap, his lips sealed. When the play was finished and after all the players had taken a bow, Arnold as Sandy walked in front of all the actors and sat down center stage. The red bow had slipped from the back of his neck to the side. He sat down stage center for only a second before glancing over his shoulder, getting up and walking a few up st steps upstage to line up with the other players. Stage Annie and Daddy Warbucks took a step to the right and to the left respectively to make room for him. Arnold looked out over the audience, sitting in a circle of light, and the audience went wild. <laughs> 